great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Sandra Rogers, who is serving currently as the International Vice President at BYU and also as Associate Academic Vice President. In these positions, Sandy has responsibility for the David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies, the Ambassador Ambassadorial Visits Program, and BYU's Student Abroad Programs. In addition, she oversees the University's Division of Continuing Education. Prior to these assignments, she served as Dean of the College of Nursing at BYU for six years. All told, Sandy has served in significant academic leadership positions at BYU for 21 years. She has also served as chair of BYU Women's Conference for the past 12 years and is a member of the General Relief Society, General Relief Society Board of the Church. An Arizona native, she received her PhD in nursing from the University of California in San Francisco after receiving nursing degrees from BYU and the University of Arizona. She has served as a welfare services and health missionary for the church in the Philippines and has also given significant service leading international health and development projects in Nigeria, Jordan, the Philippines, and other parts of the world. I have worked with Sandy in all of her academic administrative assignments and can testify that she's a person of great integrity, caring, and wisdom. I think one experience I shared with Sandy and approximately 18,000 women attending the BYU Women's Conference many years ago captures aspects of Sandy's personality and the quality of her contributions at BYU and beyond. Sandy was being introduced as the next speaker in the Marriott Center and was sitting on the stand. As the person introducing her extolled some of her significant virtues, Sandy grimaced and the camera caught the grimace. The audience erupted spontaneously with warm laughter. Sandy then presented her remarks with humor, deep insights, and a powerful testimony, and the women present were drink drinking in her message. So was I. I had to leave for other meetings on campus as that session ended, but I remember feeling that I didn't want to leave what had become a spiritual feast. These sisters in Zion had accepted their sister Rogers and united their faith such that it seemed angels were present. It wasn't just Sandy who created that magic moment. I felt the importance of that gathering, the faith of women present, and Sandy's faith and humility uniting with heaven's help. BYU and many others in the church and beyond have been blessed for many years because of Sandy's significant gifts and humility that allow her to facilitate such remarkable experience. Uh, experiences. I'm delighted that we have the opportunity for one of those kinds of experiences today. I've invited Dean Wayne Lott uh, of the Division of Con uh, Continuing Education to offer an opening prayer, after which we'll have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Rogers. This stage is about the size of the cultural hall stage in my little hometown church, and I feel like I should break into a dance uh, that would fit a road show. <laughs> I want to acknowledge the presence of one of the general officers of the church who has surprised me with her uh, presence here, that's Sister Linda Reeves. Uh, second counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency. This speech could be the end of my business at BYU and the end of my business with the Relief Society. And so, uh, but I uh, appreciate uh, so many of you uh, friends uh, and colleagues uh, for coming uh, today. You might be curious about this title. Uh, what does it mean and what does it have to do with uh, my journey as a scholar of faith? Uh, for those of you who know something about uh, anatomy, the knee joint bears most of the weight of the body. The meniscus, uh, or the two menisci, have the job of cushioning the pressure between the femur and the tibia and absorbing the stress of walking and standing. 
moderating the process that includes the force of the body weight being thrust down from the top through the femur, as well as absorbing the return force transferred up as the ground pushes back through the foot and the tibia. Along with the ligaments on the side, the knee must mitigate uh, and the meniscus must miti uh, mitigate insults that come laterally to the knee. The meniscus can be damaged by injury or general wear and tear, and once it wears out, it's that very painful and develop debilitating condition as bone grinds upon bone with every step. When it tears and it's fragmented, the pieces that might be left inside the knee can cause further damage and limited movement and usually have to be surgically removed. We have a number of positions at this university, and I've occupied several of them since 1990, that are meniscus positions. A meniscus position is the one where you must interpret the desires and the goals and the concerns and the aspirations of all of the people who report to you to those to whom you report. And then you also must interpret the desires, aspirations, goals, and views and concerns of those to whom you report down to those who report to you. In other words, you're caught between two opposing forces. And your job is to manage the lateral stresses and the stresses that come up and down to make it possible for the knee to move and to manage the opposite uh, forces of muscle contraction and muscle extension so that the work moves forward. All of this functional work by the knee is influenced by our genetics, uh, our previous injuries or congenital conditions, and it's influenced by some of our behavioral choices. Similarly, our unique personality types and experiences shape how wearing this meniscal work at the university can be, just like our genetics and previous injuries influence the performance of the meniscus in our knees. I have a genetic predisposition to the wearing out of the meniscus. There are things that you can do to reduce that risk when you have the genetic influence that I have. I chose to do none of them. <laughs> I still eat chocolate as a way to manage stress, so never lost the weight that is very helpful in minimizing uh, stress uh, to the knee. Likewise, uh, when we take these meniscal positions at the university, we uh, have opportunities to learn how to better manage the forces that are at play in our assignments. And so today I would like to uh, share with you some of my thoughts about being in a meniscus position. I'm not a scholar of organizational behavior administration educational or professional, leadership or anything close to it. In fact, I have consciously avoided studying in any of these areas. As a graduate student on leave from BYU getting my doctorate in San Francisco, I was visited by Dean June Lifeson, who kindly suggested that I should take advantage um, of the opportunity to enroll in courses in administration while I was in graduate school because they could be helpful in my future. I politely rejected her suggestion as a waste of time because I had no interest or plan uh, to do anything connected with administration. However, my father grew up as the oldest son of a widowed mother during the Depression, and it would have been unthinkable to him sometimes to my mother's dismay, to refuse any assignment given to him by his employer. I was taught by that example, and so when my file leaders, June Lifeson, Todd Britch, Rex Lee, Alan Wilkins, Merrill Bateman, and Cecil Samuelson asked, I accepted these administrative assignments and then went home to wonder, like Sister Hinckley, how did I get in such a mess? I don't have advanced knowledge in administrative fields that would be evidenced by a doctoral degree or advanced coursework. I don't have frequent peer-reviewed research publications in tier one journals in any of these disciplines. 
And to be honest, I don't have continued publications in nursing either. But according to Webster, a scholar can be someone who has stud studied a subject for a long time. And I can say that I have studied what it is like to be in a meniscus position through a one subject case study for the past 25 years. <laughs> I came to each of these positions like most of us on the faculty at the university who didn't study administration or management. We have steep learning curves when we take these positions. I came to know that God has a sense of humor. When I became the dean, I was overcome with curiosity. And so, now wielding my power at will, requested my student records from the archives. It's an interesting experience to see what your faculty thought about you and what they wrote about you in secret and never shared with you during your class evaluation sessions. I learned that the faculty in the College of Nursing had pegged me dead on because all of the evaluations in each course shared the same themes. Number one, I was a decent student. Number two, I was terribly anxious in new situations. Number three, I was slow and methodical. In other words, I usually had to think about it, whatever it was, for a long, long time. You can see why I wasn't all that good at ICU or emergency room nursing with those kinds of qualities. But like most of those at the university put into my situation, we're good citizens, and we give up our personal agendas and try to do our best. And I have great appreciation for the deans and the chairs and others on this campus who are willing to accept these meniscal positions. So here are some of the lessons that I have learned uh, about being in a meniscus position and some things that might mitigate the wear and tear of such assignments. The first is make sure God supports you in the job. I'm grateful that those who asked me to serve from time to time allowed me the time to learn for myself that my loving Heavenly Father was supportive of that service. That didn't mean that God ever told me, Sandy, you're the only one that could do this job, because he never did. And that didn't mean that I didn't feel a sense of, in, of, of uh, desperation and I certainly never felt that I was infallible or that I was God's gift to the, to the university system. In every instance, it was me explaining to the Lord my genetic predispositions, my previous knee injuries, so to speak, that made me an unlikely candidate. And then receiving his assuring response that although the choice didn't look good on paper, he would be there to assist. Over and over, I could see in my mind on these occasions, the woman um, on, the, on the street in Jerusalem who uh, has had an issue of blood for 12 years and believes that if she can just touch the hem of the Savior's garment, she'll be healed. Uh, when she does, he feels power, uh, virtue go out of him and asks, who touched me? And his disciples say, we're in a crowd. How do you expect us to know who touched you? Everybody touched you. But then he sees the woman, and she admits that uh, she was the one who reached up uh, to touch the hem of his garment. I have often felt in that position that I'm the one reaching up uh, to somehow find access to the virtue and power that the Lord has to help us when we accept these kinds of assignments. Knowing that I could beg for grace at the mercy seat from an all-knowing one was the reassurance that I needed. And I recognized that I needed the Holy Spirit more than ever. I needed help to see my weaknesses and how to make changes that would benefit those that I served in my position. Sometimes I even needed help to recognize the few strengths I may have brought to the situation. I began to slowly real, realize that the Lord had not left me bereft of preparation. 
In 1999, Alan Wilkins invited me to take the position of Associate Academic Vice President for International Distance and Continuing Education, a title so long you can't get it on a business card. <laughs> The incumbent in this position was Cheryl Brown, who was getting married and leaving BYU. Cheryl spoke several languages, had a great deal of international experience, and was an expert in linguistics. A major focus in this new assignment was on English as a Second Language projects. I knew nothing about it. There were so many nights when I went home to ask the Lord why he was so enthusiastic about inefficiency. <laughs> if the end result was to have excellent ESL projects abroad, and there were two older single sisters on campus in the queue for a marriage proposal, <laughs> why hadn't he selected the nurse <laughs> for the proposal and left the linguistics expert on hand for the ESL project? It's a reasonable question, don't you think? <laughs> he didn't answer that question. He said, you're the one on the spot now. I'll send help for you to figure it out. At that time, there was also a slight shock wave that went through the traditional international areas in social sciences and humanities that a nurse, of all things, was now responsible for international stuff. I don't know what feedback Alan received, but several professors were brave enough to confront me directly, <laughs> saying, can you possibly explain to me why you're qualified for this job? <laughs> that forced me back into a conversation with the Lord about qualifications, asking, do I bring anything to the table here? I grew up in a small place next door to the middle of nowhere. My parents, with their high school educations, were children of the Depression with meager resources. It was not until I priced an encyclopedia in my 30s that I realized the sacrifice my parents had made to purchase those books and all available companion volumes in science literature and my ultimate favorite, Lands and Peoples, which I read over and over again. I realized that I had received from preparation through my parents' inspired purchase. I also realized that my work as a welfare services missionary, a call I received with much misgiving and disappointment because I hated my public health course in nursing school <laughs> and didn't want to do anything like that for my missionary service. You can see I've had to have a lot of attitude adjustments <laughs> along the way. But I realized that it also prepared me with a set of principles that could guide my direction and my decision and my choices. The Lord had given me some preparation, and I wasn't quite as bereft as I imagined. And then he blessed me with fine mentors and colleagues and people with whom I would work who were there to guide me and coach me and teach me and encourage me, and I will be forever grateful to those friends. I've also recognized that we all have a place and should be respected for what we bring to the table. I attended a dean's co uh, council once to hear one of my colleagues announce that there was no place for professional schools at the university. I just sucked it up and decided to go ahead and be the dean of a professional school at the university and try to make us have a contribution. I remember once uh, during a semester where I felt particularly busy as the dean. I was teaching a two-credit course. I had given um, enough guest lecturers to count uh, for another two-credit course. And one day I was out in the open uh, uh, lobby area of the college and I said, <clears throat> uh, I, I really feel busy and I'm teaching as much as some of the faculty. And one of the faculty uh, members happened to be standing there and she turned to me and said, yes, but you don't do clinical. 
she was right. I didn't do clinical. I did a whole lot of other things that I thought were necessary for the College of Nursing, but it was true, I didn't do clinical. And so I decided to try to learn that every role was valuable. And even those of us who didn't do clinical might still be valuable to the College of Nursing. The next thing that I learned is that you have to manage the expert authority challenge. You have to manage the fact that being an expert in one thing doesn't make you an expert in other things. My favorite example of this fallacy was watching Jessica Lang and Sissy Spacek testify before a congressional committee on farming. <laughs> Why? Because they had played farm wives in movies. <laughs> I learned that experts also may not always see the big picture. They may not always see all of the additional outside influences and perspectives that one has to manage uh, in a meniscal position. But when these experts know something that you don't know, you need to learn from them and you need to learn in a hurry. And that's what I have had to do often. I have had to seek out people who knew more than I did. And that represents almost all the campus. I needed to borrow from their storehouse, so to speak, in order to learn. And then I had to learn how to evaluate what they shared with me in the context of the other things that I knew. Uh, the direction that I had received from my file leaders, for example but I had to be willing to listen and I had to be willing to learn. And so one of my mantras became be teachable, be teachable, be teachable. I had to learn to listen and to be taught by people who know much more than I do. And I've had to learn things I never thought that I would have any interest in learning. In fact, I'm not sure that I'm still interested in learning many of those things. But I recognized that I couldn't just pursue my own agenda. I had to learn those things in order to have my position be a service and not a detriment uh, to the campus community. I've learned to work hard to try to see the whole and the parts and to see how my part contributes to the whole. My uncle was killed in Italy in World War II. My grandparents grieved almost forever. His photo in his uniform was always in a prominent place in their home. And at every family function, Uncle Charles was acknowledged. As a child, I knew that this had been a terrible loss for my family. Several years ago, I found a book on the history of the Italian campaigns in World War II. I bought it and read it to have some insight about my uncle's service and his death. I discovered that with an allied battle plan agreed upon and in place, the American general made an independent decision that he was going to be the hero who liberated Rome rather than allow another allied general to do it. And so he swung his entire army and my uncle completely out of position in the battle plan. Suddenly, rather than being engaged with less than willing Italian troops, my uncle and his fellow soldiers faced the teeth of battle-hardened Germans who had been earning their stripes on the Russian front. The losses in American lives were immense, and one of those losses was my uncle. The American general did take Rome, but at great cost. But he did it on June 6th, 1944. And he was never hailed as the great conquering hero because a little action up at Normandy on that day completely overshadowed everything that he had done. He was back page news before he even had a chance. I learned from that that when you know the battle plan, stick with it. When I was finishing my PhD the university, at the University of California in San Francisco, it was rated the top graduate program in nursing in the country, and they were very proud of it. I had several professors, all with expert knowledge in my discipline, and where my discipline was going, tell me that I should not return to BYU because I would be wasted in that backwater of education in Provo, Utah. That's a direct quote. They were the best in my field. They were experts. 
but they didn't know everything I knew. And part of what I knew was that I should be at BYU. So I do have great expect, respect for experts, and I have gone to many on this campus to learn. I have great respect for good and grounded scholarship. And I confess to having a healthy skepticism for some of what we produce in the academy. In those important scholarly shaping experiences of my master's degree preparation at the University of Arizona, I learned much about healthy skepticism. A professor was presenting her research in a conference on cultural differences in health beliefs and practices. The focus of her research was Mormon women and childbirth. The results she described were amazingly ludicrous to me. I thought she must have made up the entire thing. The professor claimed her information was accurate because she was an insider to the culture, and therefore the women would feel safe and comfortable in opening up to her. I chose to meet with her in her office to discuss my perceptions of her work. After inviting me to have a cup of coffee freshly brewed by her desktop, Mr. Coffee Maker, she asked how she could help me. When I explained the reasons why I couldn't agree with her work, she stated, you must be one of those fools who follow Kimball. Needless to say, in October of 1980, she was one of the three women who stood in general conference and shouted no during the sustaining of President Kimball in general conference. She sold herself as an expert, but I had a lot of doubts about her methodology. I've developed a healthy respect for the principle of being humble in your conclusions and not leaping your research data. I have a healthy respect for good research designs and for doing everything you can to eliminate your own biases in your work and in your conclusions, because I continue to have to work on that myself. Part of managing the expert fallacy for me is alignment, which is really essential in the meniscus position. I know more now about the ideas of faculty, alumni, donors, state department retirees, international business executives, church employees, missionaries, and even some area and general authorities regarding BYU's purposes, opportunities, and should do's than I have ever known before. But just as there is safety in the knee when the joint stays in alignment with very little rotation and little outside lateral pressure, there is safety in alignment at the university. Lateral forces can be demons for knees. I've learned how important it is to hear counsel and to know whose counsel counts the most. Alignment doesn't mean that you don't listen to everyone and that you don't try to hear and try to understand You'd have to have counsel from both directions when you're the meniscus position. But it's true with the knee, we move forward best when we manage those opposing forces and stay in alignment. One of the great blessings of my assignment was the opportunity to meet with the President's Council each month when then Elder Irene, Commissioner of Church Education, would come down. The last agenda item in our meetings was always counsel from Elder Irene. I began to see the themes in what he said. Learning to hear counsel was probably the most prominent. I remember one day the, uh, the discussion included hearing counsel when it's given, hearing counsel in what is not said. I've spent years trying to figure out how to hear counsel in what is not said. A second prominent theme from Elder Irene was protect the brand, protect the brand. That has been burned into my brain as I receive all sorts of proposals for partnerships and the good things that BYU can do. The fourth thing that has helped me manage my menisci positions is to think like a night nurse. For those of you who might not be familiar with this particular skill set, let me explain. One of the greatest challenges for me when I was a night nurse was deciding when to call the doctor. Calling the doctor in the middle of the night is not an easy proposition. 
It's like defending your dissertation. <laughs> you better have a really good reason when you call the doctor in the middle of the night. So before calling the doctor at three in the morning, the good night nurse thinks, what information does the doctor need in order to make a decision about this patient problem? What questions will he ask me? What else is important? You don't ring the doctor at 3 a.m. and not have on hand the latest lab reports, the latest vital sign checks, the trends of all of the important indicators over the last few hours, the current medications and when they were last administered, the amount of drainage, the size of the blood on the dressing, the patient history, their list of allergies, I could go on but you don't call the doctor without all of those things in hand. You never simply call and say, here's the problem, would you please fix it? You have to think about the information and what additional information will be needed. You have to compare and contrast current and past test results, always thinking about how this influenced the patient's condition. I've learned not to take a question or a problem forward unless I've done the best I can with the night nurse routine. I've learned a lot about research designs, quantitative and qualitative validity and reliability, theoretical congruence, instrumentation, statistical assumptions, and the appropriateness of certain statistical tests. Everything I learned about collecting data, evaluating data, judging data, measuring levels of confidence, have come into play in carrying out a night nurse routine in my assignments here at BYU. I have been so grateful for those tools of our academic trade. As I have been assigned to do interesting things like chair the NCAA accreditation for the university or dean searches or preparing reports for the board of trustees, or on certain complex issues or evaluating centers or units or sitting on appeal panels. The tools of traditional scholarship have been a blessing in trying to assure accuracy, fairness, and completeness in that work. Last but not least, I have learned that the atonement works at work. There are so many ways that I have learned that this is true. Not long after beginning the deanship, I agreed to a major evaluation as part of collecting data for our professional accreditation. The feedback was almost overwhelming. I had made some major mistakes. I had lost the trust of some of my faculty colleagues. I took all the raw data with me to a monthly visit with then academic vice president Todd Bridge. I explained that the results revealed some very serious concerns about my performance, and I suggested that with this information, he may want to reconsider my appointment. Todd said, I don't need to read all of that. Why don't you just select the things that you think are the most important and begin to work on them? He gave me a chance. And that chance was possible because of the atonement. I had made mistakes, not maliciously or by intent. My motives were good, I thought, but the results were not. I remember learning through that experience that the atonement covers mistakes as well as sins. I remember how freeing it was to actually believe it was possible not to be condemned forever in the eyes of my colleagues because of my mistakes. But like most improvement processes, I also recognized that what the atonement made possible would require work. I have learned to admit when I've been wrong. I've learned it's best to admit a mistake and ask forgiveness, whether you're admitting your errors to your boss or your colleagues or your staff or any of those who report to you. It is really the atonement that allows us to learn and to grow and to improve. And an admission of an error is the beginning of learning what to do better. It's crucial to restoring the trust, restoring the pledge, as Ezekiel termed it. I have also learned that the atonement means I can learn to be a better Christian in my work here. I recall being faced with a particular difficult and complicated personal and personnel issue. I couldn't see a way out of the morass. The answer to my pleadings was to read the Beatitudes. 
being reminded of meekness, humility, poor in spirit, and turning to the Savior, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, made me reconsider the problem through an entirely different lens. On another occasion, I felt stymied at every course I took. I felt blindsided and manipulated. I felt misunderstood. I felt helpless to do anything about it. This went on for some time with the trajectory of depression and frustration. I'm sure I was not functioning very well in my assignment. Then one day, a colleague who was sensitive to the whisperings of the spirit stopped by my office. He expressed his care and concern for me. He said he didn't know how to help me, but he knew the Savior could. Again, I went home, and this time my pleadings led me to charity and other attributes of the Savior. I learned more about patience. I learned more about temperance, and I learned more about forgiveness. Nothing in that awful situation, which lasted almost a year, changed. But I changed because of the grace of the atonement. I was no longer held captive by my situation. I was free, and I was not burdened in heart or in mind. I have learned that when nothing you do seems to be right, when nothing you try in your limited capacity seems to have any effect, when you think you can't be stretched anymore and there isn't an answer and you can't learn one more thing, you are really in the hands of a divine redeemer, the omniscient one who's full of grace and truth and mercy. I've learned that when you have covenant-making colleagues who are also trying to follow that divine redeemer, you can work things out. I have felt the power of temple covenants in my life and in the lives of those here at BYU to whom I could turn for counsel and for blessings of instruction and comfort. Things may not seem fair. Squeaky, obnoxious wheels may get more things than good university citizens. Good university citizens may make sacrifices so that other university citizens can get whatever they want. Sound familiar? All the work you do is rarely understood and often not appreciated. But the atonement does work at work. When I became the dean, I prayed for wisdom, courage, consistency, and congruency. I still pray for those qualities. Meniscal positions require these and and more. Being in a meniscus position exposes all of our shortcomings and our imperfections. But if you notice the bookends of these five uh, items, When you're sure that God will support you in the job, and when you remember that the atonement works at work, then anything is possible. These meniscal positions teach us how to wrestle with our weaknesses in front of our peers and our colleagues. They teach us to appreciate the good people who can help us to learn and and who enlighten us. They send us on soul-searching journeys where we can be led to good conclusions through faith. The last 25 years have been a great and wonderful school. I have learned that with faith we can survive as someone in a meniscus position. I express my gratitude to many wonderful colleagues and friends who have taught and mentored me. I thank them for their patience and for their care. Most of all, I am thankful for the Lord's grace and goodness and pray continually to be one of the sheep who hears his voice. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Yes. As a meniscus, what great tear do you have, or have you been replaced and all? <laughs> Her question has to do with the change that's been announced in uh, the leadership of the university and, and 
what's going to happen? Will I be replaced? Is that? No, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I would never presume that. Then. Okay. Think, as a meniscus, are you, what great tear do oh. you have, or have you been replaced? <laughs> ah, very good. She's, what she's asking is, after these years in a meniscal position, what's the shape of my knees? My, my knees lasted until 2003. Uh, at that time, uh, I exchanged uh, the meniscus and the ligaments for two titanium uh, implants in the tibia and uh, in the femur. And uh, that's been a great reduction uh, in uh, the misery uh, that I was experiencing before. Uh, for any of you who would like to uh, try that route, I could highly recommend it. Uh, um, but I'm grateful to live at a time when uh, the progress of medicine has been such uh, that I could replace uh, those knees. I was actually speaking a little bit more metaphorically. Uh, <laughs> all right. Have you survived all that has been the pressure that's been put on you in that way? I have learned enough to be grateful. Um, I learned that uh, there are many important principles uh, that aren't learned uh, without uh, some challenge. That if our lives are, are easy uh, and without tests, um, we uh, don't have certain opportunities to grow. Uh, I have often wondered why the the Lord uh, suffered the university to be my learning experience. Because we have a lot of, of people at the university who have, uh, whether I was the dean or the associate dean, who had to sort of live through my learning experiences. And I've been grateful uh, to them to do that. Uh, I think that there are some things, for example, that one learns through uh, parenthood that single people don't learn unless they've had some of the opportunities uh, that I have had. I can relate, uh, I think, much better uh, to parents uh, as, I've, I've, as I have had to weigh uh, decisions about someone's employment, about differences of opinion between uh, different parts of campus. Uh, I've learned to, to do some things that I think parents usually learn to do with their children. Not that the things here are childish, but I think they, they taught me uh, some of those things. But I, I truly have felt that um, uh, there's, uh, I believe it's in John, the instance uh, where I think it's a blind man is brought to the Savior and those who are bringing him ask, uh, who sinned, uh, this man or his parents? Uh, that he is in this condition. And the Savior said, uh, neither. Uh, he's in this position so that the power of God could be manifest. And sometimes I think that's what's happened to me. I have had to learn to let the power of, of God, not in trying to, to um, find the most important answer, but the power of God working in me to help me know how to manage uh, my assignments, to deal with the questions that have, uh, have come forward. And that's been worth everything. Yes, Wade. There's an old joke in Wyoming that if the wind ever stops blowing, the cows will all fall over. And, and I'm just wondering, after you get out of this job with all this pressure, are there things that you're looking forward to that, that uh, you, do, you imagine, do you imagine activities or challenges that don't relate to all this upward and downward pressure of being in the middle of it? What does that, what does that feel like to you looking okay. forward? Or are you afraid that when the wind stops blowing, you're comfortable? <laughs> <laughs> um, Wade's question was um, uh, based on the principle that if the wind stops blowing, will the cows fall over? And, and if I'm out of this position, what will... Uh, what do I have to uh, sort of look forward to? Um, my dream uh, costs a lot of money. Uh, I would like, uh, I have a, a great interest in nursing history. And 
I have studied enough, I'm an amateur, but I've studied enough to recognize that the experiences of the U.S. military nurses who were incarcerated in the Philippines by the emperor years 1942 to 1945 were similar but different experiences from the British, Australian, and Dutch nurses who were incarcerated uh, in Malaysia, Sumatra, uh, by the same uh, forces of the emperor uh, in the same years. I want to find out why those experiences were different. Um, I have some tentative hypotheses. But I'll need the money to travel to England to check on the uh, Royal College of Nursing historical records. I'll need the money to travel to Sydney uh, to check on the uh, resources of the ANZAC uh, Nursing Corps. I want to go to Sumatra. Uh, I've been to Santa Tomas, the site where the nurses in the Philippines were interned. And I'll need somebody who reads Japanese because I'll probably need to end up in some Japanese records of that same period. That's what I'll do when I, I'll hunt for the money and then that's, uh, that would be exciting. I'm Center for European Studies that could help with the London <laughs> <laughs> So uh, uh, if that doesn't happen, I'm putting in my mission papers. I think I could run a mission office. <laughs> You can run a mission. <laughs> no, don't have the keys. <laughs> but I can run that office. So. Yes, Randy. Sandy, what, uh, along this journey uh, as a meniscus, uh, in a meniscus position, what has been your greatest joy? Randy's asked, in this uh, uh, journey in being a meniscus, what's been, brought me the greatest joy? And I would say the people. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a few, um, just a few little examples. Uh, I remember uh, the way uh, the officials who managed a theater in Belarus responded to our folk dance students on tour there. And you knew what had happened. They had felt the light the students had. I have seen uh, very suspicious and wary international guests come to campus. They meet with our faculty, they meet with our students, and instead of being suspicious and wary, they're asking me how their children can come to school at BYU. I have celebrated wonderful partnerships that I see in, uh, in parts of campus. I, I look at what Dean Rosenberg and Dean Ogles are doing uh, in the areas of their work that uh, intersect with mine. They're making wonderful things happen at this university uh, for our students. Uh, I sit in a, a devotional offered by the uh, Director for Development for Athletics and feel his enthusiasm about being here. And the people that I work with are fine and good people. And they teach me. And it's been a privilege and blessing uh, to learn uh, from them. I work with a wide variety of people. I work with deans, I work with chairs, I work with people in the Kennedy Center, I work with artistic directors in the Department of Dance and the School of Music. We work with church hosting. I work with area presidencies. I have a wonderful job, and it's the people who make the difference. Any other questions? Yes, still. Hi. This is a little bit off topic, but you've been in your position for quite a while, and I wondered if you would be willing to articulate not the vision of your job, but the vision of BYU's interface with the international world, with the world. Okay. 
I'll, I'll use it by illustrating an example of, of, of what isn't our, our interface. Um, not too long after a certain president was appointed at the University of Utah, he created a document about this thick about the university's international direction. Uh, I don't know if it's still in force now uh, because he's no longer uh, the president uh, there. And there was a lot of, of top-down uh, uh, strategies uh, that, that came uh, from that particular document. And I can remember uh, discussing, uh, discussing that and the direction uh, that, that uh, we eventually moved to was that uh, top-down approaches to those kinds of things don't work. Uh, but we should try to provide the services, uh, the assistance, um, the help when we can uh, that colleges and departments can achieve their international goals and, and strategies. So we went to work in trying to build a service-oriented culture in the Kennedy Center that would uh, assist uh, colleges and departments in, in their uh, international goals. Uh, we tried to um, help facilitate and make connections with faculty travel uh, to appropriate places so that they can continue to do that. Uh, the university is inviting more international guests to campus uh, in a strategy that says, come and see uh, what we are and what we do. Uh, in the last uh, 13 years, uh, we went from having no Title VI or uh, Department of Defense centers to having five. Um, we have gone from having almost all of our study abroad programs concentrate in the colleges of humanities and family, home, and social sciences. And now there's hardly a college on campus that doesn't have some kind of uh, international work and connection. We're making better friends. We're aligned with church priorities uh, now. And one of the things that's most exciting to me is to see that the Board of Trustees uh, is positive about us being um, being a, uh, a help to the church because we're a good university, not because we're out running around trying to do the job of public affairs people abroad or welfare people abroad or any of those people. The church has their folks who do that, but they come to respect us as a good university. Uh, our faculty are doing recognizable work uh, in areas that make international colleagues interested in coming. And so I think the universities um, were supportive of good international work. We want it to be meaningful. We want it to be safe. Uh, Alan used to call me the incredible no woman because I had to say no to so many uh, different things. But we're, we're tr trying as hard as we can to uh, to facilitate the things that are important because when they are important to the faculty and important to the to the departments and the colleges they last and they have staying power and they're recognizable by people whose opinions count when it comes to academic institution yes Maybe one last question um, I'm I think that you have a particularly unique background in heritage in terms of coming to be an academic, and I wondered if you could speak about the ways in which the lessons you learned from your childhood would influence the ways in which you could learn about health and productive in this, what seems like an international position contract. Okay. Uh, the question was about uh, the influences of my early years uh, in getting to this position. Uh, Jim Taranda, one of our professors of Arabic and Islamic studies, and I laugh because we went to similar high schools about 40 miles apart, and who would have thought uh, that either of us would be in the kind of uh, position that we, uh, that we are now. Uh, just a few little uh, thoughts about that. Um, my small hometown was a missionary-minded place. 
Uh, the people who settled there were sent there by Brigham Young. Um, when I was growing up, it was probably 99.5% LDS. But we lived in a sea of diversity. Uh, we had the Native American culture. We had uh, a Spanish culture that had come north uh, with the vaqueros who came to work on the ranches. We had um, African Americans who had come from uh, the, the south with the um, Santa Fe Railroad. And uh, we had uh, a number of Asians. In fact, uh, the father of one of my best friends in high school uh, had flown with the Flying Tigers uh, during World War II. Uh, and his mother had had to uh, refugee uh, delivering a child just one step ahead of the Japanese army in, in China. So there was this unique experience of having a very LDS tight culture in the sea of diversity. Um, we sent out a lot of missionaries and they went everywhere and they came home and gave their reports. And so although we felt that this, we were sort of isolated, uh, we felt like we were part of a, something bigger, part of a larger uh, program or plan. Um, my father and mother were very encouraging uh, to me, but they were also very careful. My father's only experience with college graduates uh, was with school teachers. And he reckoned that only about 50% of them could balance a checkbook. And since he worked at a bank, balancing a checkbook was a critical skill. And so I can remember him as I came to BYU the first time, he said, Sandra, whatever you do, please don't ever bounce a check. <laughs> I can promise you that I've never bounced a check. Um, I had wonderful teachers in that little school. Uh, I was tempted to bring one of my yearbooks um, uh, to show you the influence of one of those teachers. He had uh, under his photo in the faculty section, which was three pages. It wasn't a big faculty, it was a small school. And, and he had written, um, we will see you as Dr. Rogers one day. That was an unheard of uh, kind of thing, and I don't even think I had that goal uh, when I came uh, to school to study uh, the first time. But he was encouraging. Uh, another year in a different yearbook, uh, he wrote, our country and our world needs men and women like you. It was just the influence of a, of a small town math teacher. But, but it had an effect. So those are some of the things I can think of off the top of my head that might have been an influence. You join me again and thank you so much. Thank you.